Hello, I'm Emma Bruner at Discovery Park of America. And this week, Real Food Forward is made possible by our friends at the University of Tennessee at Martin. UT Martin offers more than 100 academic areas of study with 18 undergraduate degree programs. Today's guest is Matt Dellinger, author of Interstate 69. This is Scott Williams, your host of Real Foot Forward, where every single week we talk about the history, the accomplishments, and the people of West Tennessee. I've got a really special guest with us here today. Matt Dellinger is here. He's the author of this very interesting book about I-69, which it's backwards right now, but um, it's an amazing book. Um, Matt, I'll tell you the first uh, time that I became aware of this book, I was up in the tower here at Discovery Park and I was with, you know, maybe 20 people having lunch who, you know, were all people who worked in the state, people who worked in tourism and, and in travel. And, you know, I said, guys, what is up with this thing? You know, I'm kind of new to the area. What, what the heck? When is this? And nobody could really answer me. So that's when I decided to dive in and really look. And you don't have to look very far before you find out that there's a whole book <laughs> written about I-69. So we're going to get into that a little bit. But first yeah. of all, I want to hear a little bit about how you went from um, Indianapolis um, yeah. to New York City uh, with no real major prospects or, it, it, you know, you just jumped in and started work and tell us about that. Um, I, do you know this story already? A little bit. You do, you've done your research. Wow. Um, well, I, I'm a very lucky guy is the is the short answer. But uh, I went to a small liberal arts school called DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana, and majored in English. And I was on the school paper and um, had a radio show and things like that. And uh, I did an internship. They really encourage you to get out in the world and work, uh, do internships and study abroad and things like that. So I did an internship in New York City uh, at Interview Magazine, which this pop culture magazine started by Andy Warhol. Um, and that was very interesting for that. That's a whole other half hour conversation, probably. But um, it was kind of, you know, growing up in Indianapolis and kind of on the outskirts of Indianapolis in a almost semi rural setting next to a cornfield and across from a tree nursery, uh, you know, living in New York City, I expected to be um, just more difficult than it was. And I actually found it. This was in 1996. And um, I got along with the city pretty well. I'd been there once or twice, and uh, it was it was ex you know an exciting, um, vibrant, diverse, uh, energetic place to be, and it's it's you know it's really where media is uh, located is headquartered. And so if you want a job at a magazine, as I did, that's where you go. So when I graduated from college, I didn't uh, um, you know really have a job lined up and magazines don't hire you they don't fly you to new york to interview you so you've got to kind of show up and be there and there's a lot so, of people who want that same gig that's right yeah so you know they're not going to take my resume from a kid in indiana and be like hey this looks good why don't you come to new york we'll pay for everything and no you just got to go and so i i stayed on a friend's couch a college for an older college friend and uh i got very lucky and two weeks later i worked at the new yorker magazine i went to a temp agency I got a hundred percent on their Microsoft Word test. Now, I did want to I did and, want to uh, ask you about that. What exactly is <laughs> on a Microsoft Word test? Yeah, well, you you want to study for your next uh, temp yeah. job? Is that it? Well, uh, let's see. The the advanced level it said, you know, make a table, <laughs> and I had never made a table in Microsoft Word, but there is it says table up in the menu. So if you <laughs> click on that. Then it says, so it's pretty intuitive. My, you know, hats off to Microsoft Word for building an intuitive program. You know, shade these columns, do this, do that. Anyway, I, I didn't think it was that hard, but they had never seen anybody get a perfect score. And so they, they looked around for what the best job was. And it was a marketing job at The New Yorker. But then by the time I made it to that interview, the guy said, you know, you seem like you are more editorial. Would you like to be an interview for an assistant in the art department? And that was the beginning. So I'm going to, I have to jump back just one little tiny bit because I'm fascinated by Interview Magazine. So by the late okay. 90s, it had been a while, for, it had been around for a little while, right? Yes. Uh, it started uh, 68, 69, late 60s is when it started. I believe the story is that Andy Warhol started it in order to get into 
like a rock music festival, not Woodstock, but one of the other ones. And I remember it was really big, and the covers were always a celebrity that had been sort of colorized. And um, so right. what was the culture like when you come in, uh, probably fairly innocent and unaware <laughs> of the ways of the magazine world? What, what was the culture like? Well, the office was in um, Soho. You know, it was, a, it was kind of an artsy magazine. It was uh, run by this woman, Ingrid Sishi who um, has passed on, but she was a, a real force, kind of one of these um, strong personalities that ran magazines. Um, she was a, the fashion editor at The New Yorker, as a matter of fact, and the editor of Interview. And uh, seemingly to me, to, the, you know, to my Indiana eyes, and I was wearing, well, a lot like I'm wearing now, basically, <laughs> uh, you know, trying to look professional. And everyone there is wearing all black, um, <laughs> But there was a woman who I worked for who some, she was trying to open a, a jammed window one morning and, and cut her hand and had to go to the doctor on the way to, to work. And she came in with a white bandage and was apologetic that it was white and she had a black scarf wrapped around it, you know, because it didn't match the whole all black thing. So it was interesting. And, you know, I learned a lot from, um, that's where I fell in love with magazine archives because I would take my breaks in the you know, in this room that was full of old magazines and I'd grab one and open it. And in the beginning days of Interview Magazine, Andy Warhol actually conducted the interviews. It was Andy Warhol interviewing Grace Jones or Sly Stone or, an, you know, whoever um, from Hollywood, John Travolta. And it was um, in the, the Andy Warhol way, he kind of meant it as an, a big inside joke about celebrity, but it's actually fascinating to have someone with that kind of celebrity standing interviewing a celebrity it, instead of someone who's, you know, uh, whatever, um, be, being humble or, or, or trying to worship the person. It's just like two peers talking about very, not, like having a small talk conversation, but it's about, you know, celebrity. Um, and photography was obviously a big part of Interview Magazine, so I'm assuming there was an incredible photography archive. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the whole, the, the Interview Magazine archive, I think it's a treasure, actually. If anyone out there is listening, um, I'd be happy to oversee the digitization of the Interview Magazine archive. It's, I was uh, going to ask you, where, you know, who's, who owns it now? Uh, it was part of Brandt Publications. I, I'm not, you know, a couple of years ago it filed for bankruptcy, mm -hmm. um, but it's still, it's still going. Uh, I would love to see that magazine archived. I think it's a real... Um, you know, New York treasure and oh. cultural treasure. Are we, yeah, we need to make that a project. <laughs> okay, get your museum friends on it. <laughs> there you go. There you. Go. How about that? Would have been a great exhibit. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the archives for it are in Pittsburgh at his, at the Andy Warhol Museum. There, I, I've, I've I've seen a lot of um, old things from Interview Magazine. You know, not, not the magazine itself, but kind of his letters and memos and things. So then, so all the experience there led you to your next, led you to your next gig, and eventually you did be, begin archiving uh, magazine content, correct? Right at the New York. So at the New Yorker, um, I was uh, I, I started in the art department, which I didn't really have an art background except I liked photography, um, but they just needed an, an organized person to be someone's assistant and. I, I was doing a little bit of writing, some restaurant reviews and things, and I was coaching the New Yorker softball team. And uh, <laughs> I was also the guy, like the young guy who could fix the printer and help someone book airline tickets in the late 90s. And so that made me, you know, the, uh, the digital savvy person at the time. <laughs> and so in 2000, when they were going to launch their editorial website, they, um, they asked me to be in, in charge of it. And that as their digital efforts kind of grew, mostly with inbound interest, you know, it, uh, Barnes and Noble would come to them and say, we want to do eBooks or Audible would come to them and say, we want to do an audio edition. They'd kind of pass those people on to me and my boss and we would figure out what does it sound like to have the New Yorker on Audible? What does it look like to have an eBook? Um, so really just fumbling our way through those early digital efforts, um, not really fun. I mean, you know, we, we did a, I think we did a great job, but we, you know, it was a very small staff, me, and uh, virtually no budget, and we just sort of made things up. I remember the, uh, <clears throat> the first bit of audio, in fact, we put on the New Yorker website um, was me talking on the phone to John Lee Anderson, who was in Iraq, and 
I was using this like $15 Radio Shack thing that interrupted the corded phone and went to a mini plug. And I edited this thing and I was all proud of it. Um, and Condé and Ass said, we don't host audio actually. Um, you know, we can't support it. So I had to go to the cartoon bank, the, you know, the business selling cartoons to get them to host the audio of, you know, our war reporter in Iraq. So it, it was, uh, we were making things up as we went along. Um, and that was true also when we came to, to do the archive in 2005 was going to be the 80th anniversary of The New Yorker. And so I think it was 2003, um, we had picked a scanning vendor in Kansas City and I got to, with my friend Willing Davidson, who's still an editor at The New Yorker, we got to drive uh, a truck with all of the New Yorker magazines in the back, a rider truck from Times Square to, uh, to Kansas City with the whole, you know, the whole history of The New Yorker in the back. It was pretty fun That's a and nerve wracking. So you were, you were kind of in that space there where there was a lot of push and pull going on between new media and traditional media. And, you know, exactly. a lot of people with a lot at stake. Yeah, although, you know, it didn't feel, it turned out that there was a lot at stake, but uh, it, it, it didn't yet feel that way. That was a growing sense, you know, it's still, well, we've got to, we don't want to cannibalize our print product with putting too much online, and we don't want to spend too much money doing this newfangled digital stuff because most of our money still comes from these uh, full page print ads or, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the magazine industry in particular, newspapers changed much faster. They gave away more content more immediately. Their advertising dried up faster because classifies were replaced by Craigslist. Magazines had a little, a couple more years of good, of good times because luxury brands, you know, credit cards, travel, they wanted those gloss, glossy ads. Um, but, it, it, you know, looking back, it, it is, there were some decisions made and some uh, um, innovations done that really, uh, yeah, kind of paved the way. I mean, the New Yorker archive was the first digital archive uh, of a magazine, I think, um, one of the first ones to not get sued. You know, National Geographic put out a product and their photographers sued them. We... Uh, we put out a, originally a set of eight DVDs. It was like a book that you bought at the bookstore and you took it home and there were DVDs inside. Right. And it, it would say, you know, oh, you want to see this article from the 50s? Insert disc three and you'd put in disc three. Um, and obviously that all moved online. But yeah, it was it was uh, that was always the challenge was. What is a print brand like The New Yorker that's been around for 80 years? What does that look like when you move into this new space? How do you keep the same um, values in place and the same level of quality, even while you you know make it digital? And then and then the thing we used to hear a lot is monetize. How are we going to monetize this? You know, there's a whole office of people that are trying to monetize everything you're doing. Um, did did that work? Uh, doing all that, um, make the book and all that, or did it? Did it meet it, expectations? Uh, for the archive, um, I believe it was it was a success. Yeah. So the, the uh, you know Random House published it. It was a it was a it was kind of like a traditional book deal. Mm -hmm. But then it it kind of had a number of um, moments of success where it was sold as the DVD set, um, which was su successful, and then it was sold as a hard drive uh, that you plugged into your computer. Uh, and then it became part of the subscription offering around 2009 or so, I believe, um, which helped them increase the cost of a subscription. So this is what every, this is what the Washington Post and the Atlantic and the New York Times are trying to do now, which is we can't be beholden to advertising and the, and the general and the broader economy we want to have a little bit more of a direct relationship with our readers. Um, and that means charging them more, but trying to give them more at the same time. And so actually an archive is a, is a great way to, to boost what you're giving somebody digitally. Um, that's very on brand. I mean, you know, you think about all this paid content, these staffs are trying to create as much content as possible. Well, you've got a, a whole vault, of great pre-vetted, interesting on-brand content. And to put that out there 
you know, if a magazine feels like it's competing against an, an upstart blog to cover the same subject, well, that upstart blog doesn't have a hundred year history, right. but the magazine does, you know, so doing Vogue, doing Esquire, um, Aviation Week, that, that, those, that was always kind of a theme is we, we want to assert ourselves as a brand that's been around for a long time and, and an authority, therefore. And um, as a person who's had to do a lot of research, you know, on, you know, people who were, you know, back around the turn of the century. And I love those magazine archives. Um, there were a few magazines that I needed that hadn't been archived digitally. And so I just had to search around until I could find them on eBay or whatever. Um, and actually even holding the old, you know, magazines from the 1920s, you know, is uh, so interesting to me. I bet you were having so much fun surrounded by all that. Oh, yeah. I mean, and anytime I, I start a new project like that, I, I kind of volunteer. They think I'm crazy. I'm like, well, the first thing I'm going to have to do, obviously, is sit in a room with all the old magazines for a real long time right. <laughs> and look through, carefully look through them. And there's, there is a value to that. So you have to, it's, it's important to kind of map out, okay, when did it change size? You were talking about the size of interview. When did it change size? When did they introduce this feature or that feature? Because the, the, the team that's going to, um, this is getting in the weeds a little bit, but, but when, you digi- when you create a digital archive, you know, the print, it's, the, that content is not in a CMS. So you open a, pay, you open a spread of Vogue magazine from 1970, Good luck coming up with any rules about what the headline is, who's the author name. You know, the New Yorker is very regimented. It, it's looked the same since 1925. Headline, subhead sometimes, and the, the byline's either right underneath there or it's at the end of the article. Some of these magazines, are they're like visual jazz. I mean, Esquire magazine, there were some art directors there in like the 90s and 2000s where they would start a short story on the table of contents page and it would just go along the bottom of 60 pages. And that's got to be captured as a separate digital entity from everything else going on around it on the page. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my favorite part at the beginning of a, of a project is to, um, get to know the magazine, uh, you know, get to know what, what was it, was it lots of short stuff? Was it longer stuff? McLean's Magazine of Canada is a great example of this because there are, it's very old. Um, and at certain eras, it looked like The New Yorker. And sometimes it looked like Newsweek. And sometimes it looked like Harper's Magazine. You know, it kind of changed its identity and its look and feel several times. And uh, it's just, it's something I, that I delight in as well. Not just Not just the time machine aspect of it, which is pretty awesome and obvious, but even just like the, um, what you learn about magazines in general by looking at any one title. Like, um, Cosmopolitan magazine is one of my favorites that was completely different, you know, in the teens and the twenties. And, you know, it wasn't the woman's magazine that it eventually became to me. I could spend days just looking through Cosmopolitan magazines. And what's fascinating to me is it's a reminder that there were people here before us. You know, the, the, yeah. it isn't all about us. You know, there was a whole culture. There are things you, you look through those magazines and you see little little cultural milestones and things that you're oblivious to until you start doing that. So, Well, yeah. And you, you, you see all the you see a lot of flaws, too. You see uh, ads for cigarettes that say, you know, this athlete prefers this or cigarette this because it's before it's milder. <laughs> yeah. Or you see, you know, you see uh, people of different genders and races portrayed in negative ways. Uh, right. You see, there's a lot of, I, I was looking at National Lampoons um, for a project, a cartoon project. And, uh, you know, the, there was really, it was really in style to make fun of blind people in the 80s. You know, there's, there's this era of like blind jokes, you know. Yeah. And it's, you know, where did that come from? That's so weird, but it's, it was a trope and it was, uh, so yeah, you do, it, it is, um, uh, it's, it's a fascinating look into a different mindset in a different culture. So you were, so you were doing all this great work in archives and with magazines and were you aspiring to be an author during this time of a book? Well, the, the New Yorker was the one, um, project I did pre I-69 
Um, I, I actually did the Vogue archive as I, as I 69 interstate 69 was being published. Um, but yeah, the, the, the book thing, the the interstate 69 was, uh, something that came up on my radar because I was from Indiana. You know, that's kind of where the most contentious leg of I 69 was. There was the more, the, the biggest fight over it. My dad moved to Houston in the early aughts. And, and I heard people talking about I-69 in Houston. And then I had done some stories for the Oxford American Magazine in the Mississippi Delta and heard a whole other conversation about I-69. So I just, I, I heard about this one individual road project from three different perspectives. And it was like, you know, they didn't share anything in common. It was as, you know, in one place um, in Indiana, it was like, well, do we really want this? You know, we don't like what the interstate's going to bring. It's going to bring, we have this nice little off the beaten path life here, and we don't want the interstate to come and bring strip malls and everything. And then in the South, uh, it was, look, we're all the, the jobs are, have been slowly drying up for a long time. We are off the map. This interstate could really be lifeblood, bring lifeblood back to our communities. And in Texas, it was, we're, we're growing by leaps and bounds. Of course, we need to build more interstates. This is just, we're just keeping up with uh, the booming economy. And I just thought, you know, no one, I was reading news articles, you know, going online, searching, looking through archives and um, newspapers were doing a pretty good job of covering their local, the local story, but uh, nobody had looked at all of it. And as I started to look at all of it, I just was uh, I was personally kind of moved and interested in what it seemed to show about America and, and this interesting case study for a part of the country that was not being paid much attention to and still isn't really. But uh, so I, I pitched a story to The New Yorker. They declined the story. Fair enough. Uh, you know, I'm trying to write about a, a highway, a controversial highway project in Indiana, which in 2004 was not that interesting. But I just stuck with it, and I would on my vacations I'd go fly to Memphis and spend a week interviewing people. Wrote little stories for the Oxford American um, about the bridge project down there. Yeah, but, I want to uh, touch on that just a little bit before we move on. So you went go to Memphis, you go to the mm-hmm. uh, tea room, um, the little tea shop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the little tea shop, which sounds you know like a you know it, it's not what it sounds like. Um, it's a great place. It's not. To go. I, you know, I'm from Memphis. Um, and so um, I'm fascinated by the story of the bridge. Um, so I want you to touch on that just a little bit and what you discovered about that. Um, spoiler alert, uh, my wife and I actually bought one of the lots uh, that were made available years later. And we built a house there um, where the interstate would have rolled right over. So, um, so we were really into that whole story. Oh. On Sumner Avenue, like over on... Uh, yeah, at um, Overton Park in Avalon, over there by the zoo. Yeah. Um, at, oh, no kidding. At Overton Park. So we so we were very attuned to the story, but for listeners who don't know anything about that, who are from West Tennessee, it might be interesting for you to touch on it. Well, you're talking about the Supreme Court case. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I was on a reporting trip down in Memphis, and uh, I, I vaguely knew that... Um, there had been, you know, court cases about the the NEPA, the the Environmental National Environmental Protection Act. Um, I think I might have that wrong. Anyway, we'll see what that acronym stands for. But uh, <laughs> I, I wandered into this lunch spot called the Little Tea Shop, and uh, I was I was. It's it was in, in downtown Memphis, yeah. And I wasn't feeling well. Um, nowadays, you don't go out if you're not feeling well. That's very important. But, uh, For sure. but I wasn't feeling well, and I went out anyway. I flew to Memphis anyway. And I uh, had kind of you know lost my voice, and I, I end up in this tea shop. And as I'm leaving, there's a, uh, a bumper sticker by the cash register that says, Don't Split Shelby Farms. And there's a road going through two fields of green. Different, not about I-69, but I didn't know that. And I asked about it, and I explained that I was there to write about Interstate 69 and the proprietor, Suhair uh, Lauk, who, who still runs the place, although it's closed because of COVID at the moment. Um, she says, oh my God, you've got to talk to Paula. And Paula's behind uh, her at a table. 
I sit down with Paula. Paula used to work for the newspaper. Paula knows everyone in town. So Harry knows everyone in town. She starts talking a mile a minute about all, all this Interstate 69 stuff. I'm basically doing, accidentally uh, stumble into this, like the perfect place to do reporting for my book. And then at the end, uh, you know, Suhair says, you need to talk to Charlie Newman. And uh, he was the lawyer on the Overton Park Supreme Court case. And she sends me over to uh, Charlie Newman's office with a giant uh, thing of iced tea for him. You know, very small town stuff. Uh, and Charlie Newman is this amazing, um, you know, he's, he, as a young lawyer, he helped represent Martin Luther King um, the week he was shot, uh, met with him. Um, and now he, he was, in the, and then, you know, in the, the Supreme Court case, he, he was on the side of the people suing um, the Federal Highway Administration to prevent a, a giant Interstate 40 from going through Overton Park. And they called them and the essentially, little old ladies in tennis shoes, right? The little old ladies in tennis shoes, yeah. Um, and that, you know, NIMBY is kind of the term for the, you know, oh, people who just don't want anything built at all. And... What's interesting about that case, um, to me, what sticks with me is that they didn't win because it was a bad idea. The court didn't say it's a bad idea to put a giant interstate through a beloved park. What they said was, you have to study every alternative. You didn't do your homework. You didn't study the alternatives of not going through the park. And therefore, you, you're not allowed to do it. You're not allowed to go forward. The NEPA law doesn't actually guarantee that people are going to do the most environmentally responsible thing. It just sets up a, a protocol, a bunch of hoops and red tape, so that you have to document exactly how environmentally destructive your decision is going to be. And then it's up to voters and politically aware people to analyze all of that and say, you know, the state could have done this, but they did this and, and hold them accountable. And in Indiana, that is what the opponents of I-69 feel that they were doing. They were saying, you're going to spend an extra billion dollars. You're, going to ch you're choosing the most environmentally destructive route that divides the most farms instead of using existing highways the way Kentucky's going to. Um, you're choosing to do the thing. And, you know, they use lawsuits too, but the, Indiana just kept saying, okay, well, well, back to the drawing board. We'll study all the routes and then lo and behold, we'll pick the one we were going to do anyway. But, you know, they had to create a lot of documentation explaining why that decision was, um, the, the trade-offs involved in that decision. And so in the Memphis case, they lost um, and weren't able to put the interstate straight through over the park, but they had already... Well, they could have. They could have. They, they could have gone back and studied all the alternatives and, and the park one and then decided to do it. Right. But they, they took it as, you know, they took the... Uh, um, they took it as a, a reason to not, and they they put a, a boulevard. They had already cleared land, as you right. as you were mentioning. I think it's called Sumner Avenue. They had already plowed houses and cleared land on the way to the park. Yes, yeah, summer. And summer so, Avenue. Summer, not Sumner. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, you know, so so it's 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 really interesting. You're talking about being up in the tower at Discovery Park and and looking at that. Uh, you call it the landing strip or whatever in yeah. that piece, that that bare patch of earth, and um, you know I'm thinking of like the the they stopped the Embarcadero, the the elevated highway along the waterfront in San Francisco, and for a long time there was just this unfinished overpass um, in midair, you know, and and there, in my reporting there was just a lot of those scenes where you could see that they've already cut the trees down, but someone's suing them or, or this road is half finished and it goes from a brand new, newly paved road in Northern Mississippi. And then as it crosses where the overpass is going to be, it just turns to dirt. And, uh, um, I don't, I don't know where I'm going with this, but it, it, it's, it's kind of a, it, it made me look at the landscape a little differently and see, see basically individual decisions made by often individual people uh, as, as building the landscape, I just kind of always took it for granted. Like, well, of course this road is here. Of course this neighborhood is here, but every, the location of every city, the alignment of every highway, the, 
all this stuff that's not natural, um, the placement of every bridge across a river, that was a, a huge, you know, someone wielded influence, someone got done wrong, someone got rich, you know, almost anything in the landscape, man-made landscape that you see like that has winners and losers. And I think we're in a, in, in, in an ongoing conversation about um, the history of that and the ongoing effects of that. And that's why your book is so interesting because it's not just about an interstate. It's about the people and that, you know, I love a good business story. I love a good entrepreneur story, you know, and the book is about the people. It's about the meetings at the Peabody Hotel. You know, it's about the characters that, you know, we're trying to push this through. Um, if you don't mind, can you can you just touch on the Tokarskis, I think? Yes. The first couple. So those are those are the folks I was mentioning in uh, in Indiana. They they led uh, uh, several decades long opposition to the new terrain Interstate 69. They were not opposed to the state of Indiana building a new interstate, but uh, they were trying to encourage them to use a kind of dog leg um, pair of of existing highways to get it done. Like, yes, by all means, connect Indianapolis and Evansville, but do it using, you know, uh, US 41 and Interstate 70. And the state was uh, hell bent on building it through Bloomington and through Washington, Indiana, which happened to be where this David Graham um, and his, his influential family lived and owned a lot of land. Uh, the Tokarskis were, you know, he's an ophthalmologist and she does, she's a ceramicist and, and, and works in a, um, in a shop in Bloomington and they were just kind of, um, reading the news and, and saw this plan and thought that it was bunk and got a bunch of neighbors together around a kitchen table and said, you know, how are we going to, we got to speak up against this. And they, they made bumper stickers and they had public meetings and and then what was amazing they they really did their homework i mean thomas the 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 government will put out these huge reports you know these environmental impact statements which are completely unreadable you know they're and they're designed to be sort of unreadable it's it is a technical document um full of assumptions that aren't really put in the you know brought to the fore um a lot of just a lot of, you know, you hire a consultant to tell you what you want to hear is, is what the Tokarskis would describe the process as. And so they basically take apart the report and they say, well, look, you're saying this, but it, that contradicts what you said earlier about this. And, and you're, the, the number of wetlands here, you're not even taking into account the karst water formations and all the bad effects this is going to have on drinking water and da, 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 da. And so they would take it apart, hire lawyers, and, and make them redo this work, redo this work, redo this work for, um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And ultimately, they, uh, they lost. And in fact, they lost their property. Um, it's not entirely clear. I can never prove this, but the road takes a kind of a pretty weird turn, uh, to take out the back half of their property. Yikes. Um, and that could just be bad luck, but it could be, uh, retaliation. You know, retaliation. Um, so they've actually moved. They've, they, they gave up that spot and they moved downtown. Um, I think there is, you know, it's a more manageable thing as they are getting older, but well, I will always they, think about um, your book when I'm driving around and I see a house that's very close to the interstate that's or right. the construction, you know, and I think about some of the things that I read about um, in your book. Um, tell me, uh, as you were doing your research, at some point you ended up, I don't know if, I couldn't tell if you were physically here where Mr. Kirkland was building Discovery Park or if you talked to yes. him on the phone, but you were physically here. So tell us about that. <laughs> I was I was in a, a basically empty parking lot with, a, I think, a construction trailer on it. I mean, it was the very beginnings of Discovery Park, and I was looking at drawings and plans and... Uh, um, hearing about dreams and, and it sounded, you know, before it existed, I have to say Discovery Park of America sounded kind of ridiculous. I mean, not ridiculous in that the list of things um, he wanted to include. Can you hear that truck outside? It's fine. I'm going to close this window. Okay. 
Sorry. Um, no problem. You know, it's like we're going to have a, a thing, you know, like for the pioneers and, and something about space and something about science and the, something about the oceans. And, I, you know, I forget what the long list was, but it was kind of like, oh, wow. Well, you know, most places would pick one or two of these things to focus on. This guy wants to do it all. Yeah. And and in my interview with him, what really touched me was not only that he, um, how eager he was to spend as much of his fortune as he could for the community, you know? He's like, my kids will be fine. I don't need to give all of this money to them. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I want to leave something behind. And... Uh, and the way he described it to me was he said, you know, there are people in this county who have never left this county and who might grow up not, uh, not really thinking of the outside world and not really seeing themselves as a part of it, not dreaming beyond the borders of the county or the state or the region. And he wanted a place where, you know, kids could come and learn about things that would expand their minds and expand their horizons and get them um, thinking outside of, of the county. Not that the county was a bad place to be, but he just thought, um, you know, it, that, that his definition of education had to do with um, sort of getting out of the provincial thinking and, and the limited thinking of, well, these are the jobs that are available to me. These, this is the life that's available to me. Yeah, that's very that's very much what he was all about and we've really stayed true to that um very much so and i think he would be excited to see how it's developed you know um in the last five years it's continued to grow and you know what he and what were small little tiny trees are now you know big trees and yeah you know, every, you know there's been you know millions of people have come through here since since then you know and have been touched and inspired and you know we just did a project where we had a bunch of uh, juniors and seniors from several different high schools write about what discovery park meant to them and it was really moving to read all the people who picked different careers based on what they experienced here at discovery park so is that right because you know, yeah they were exposed to things they saw things they learned about things that they never would have you know because you're absolutely yeah. right it is ridiculous it makes no sense to put a hundred million dollar facility here where we're you know an hour and an hour and a half from you know any major cities like paducah or memphis or jackson and so you know you you do it does have to be spectacular to get people to make the hour and a half drive. So anyway, yeah, it's it's an amazing place. And so um, I know he was probably really excited to get to tell you about it, knowing that you were writing a book because uh, he loved yeah. authors and he loved reading. Well, what's uh, another interesting thing that kind of cuts against the, I think what he was thinking was, um, you know, that he, he put it there. I don't know how much of his inspiration to build such a place had to do with Interstate 69. But it was definitely part of the whole pitch and part of the whole vision was that this thing, I mean, there's, you know, as you described, there's literally an observation deck for you to look out at Interstate 69, which is, doesn't exist. <laughs> it's a dirt strip. And so you're describing a place that was, it was built to, it was meant to be along I-69. The highway never happened, but the place did. And the inspiration did and the education did. And what's interesting to me is I, I spent, you know, eight years reporting this book and I heard all these mayors telling me uh, how Interstate 69 was going to change everything in town and it was going to put them back on the map and it was going to bring all this opportunity. But a lot of the times it was that, you know, I'm thinking of Bill Ravel in Dyersburg, Tennessee, who was the mayor for 24 years and uh, was just a force of nature. I mean, this guy believed in Dyersburg so much and it was his his passion was making Dyersburg a better place you know yeah Interstate 69 was going to help Dyersburg but Bill Ravel helped Dyersburg um, as much as Interstate 69 was ever going to do and I think Discovery Park America has, has probably helped Union City uh, as much as in the, just the interstate you know you can't just have the interstate come through and then be like okay well let's just wait let's wait and right. wait for all this economic opportunity to result yeah. you know in southern Indiana they learned well as soon as you build the highway oh, guess what now you've got a giant uh, expense coming you've got a 
update all the water infrastructure and the sewer and the electrical and you've got to build new feeder roads and you're going to need uh, tax incentives to get the business to come there and it's like oh wait what this this road is just kind of an unfunded mandate so this is always a um people plan things like interstate 69 and they say what's going to happen they say all the good things that are going to come from it and no one ever really follows up to see if that if they happen no one ever holds it to account and I'm actually, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways, the book's 10 years ago now, and I'm trying to think of ways I can sort of update it, or, you know, go, t- take a tour of the road again, see what has happened, because I bet you that there are success stories that have nothing to do with the road, or maybe the road wasn't even built, and I bet you there's places where the road was built and it hasn't had any positive effect, or maybe it's even had a negative effect. And you do, you have a, a, a blog where you have had blogs and, you know, so you're using all kinds of media. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you could explore um, that. And I'm on board. I'll download and watch <laughs> anything that you do on this. So okay. what, are, what else have you been up to? Um, and what's <laughs> next for you? What What's the next chapter in your life? Well, um, I, you know, I've continued to do archive work, and, and in addition to magazine archives, I've I've been helping a couple of big foundations do their um, their media archives. So the Arcus Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, um, that's been a kind of uh, specialty of mine, and something I, I like doing. You know, helping. Um, I think foundations are finding that they are have to act as media companies in this in today's world. You know, they. They're telling a story. They've got to get out on social media. They've got to have um, vivid video and, and photography at their disposal. And so uh, that's that's been kind of a, a gig alongside my my writing. But at, for writing wise, at the moment, I'm uh, working on another book. It is a book about a Civil War regiment from Brooklyn, the 14th Brooklyn, and uh, it was a real transition to not be able to like do road trips to do research, you know, you, you know, sitting in a library versus driving around Dyersburg with mayor Bill Ravel, <laughs> very different writing experiences. And so, um, about eight, nine years ago, I decided I would become a, uh, a civil war reenactor and join a group of 14th Brooklyn reenactors just as a way to, to have a physical experience and, uh, to root some of the writing in, um, and so, yeah, I, uh, that's, I've been up to that. I've been, uh, you know, camping in, with a musket and uh, marching around. Not much of that with COVID. Has, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things have been canceled, but mm-hmm. uh, we, we're, not, we're not able to march in the Brooklyn Memorial Day Parade as we normally do. But um, it, it's, a, it's, you know, the, when I set out to write Interstate 69, I thought it would be almost purely an exercise in journalism. Here are the people for it and against it and why. Here are the places that stand to lose or gain from it being built. And the history element of, of that book snuck up on me. And I found that, you know, you can't tell the story of the wanting of this even, or the not wanting of it, without understanding how these places evolved, without understanding how, how did we even get to where the roads in America don't cost anything to drive on. That's an interesting story, you know. Every other countries in Europe have toll roads. We don't, except the ones that existed before. Um, why are things the way they are, and and how they get that way, and who you know who were the movers and shakers? That that became such an important part of the book. Um, so yeah, history has become increasingly fascinating to me, and and this story in particular is. Uh, I think an angle on the Civil War and an angle on Brooklyn, which has now been my home for 22 years, um, that really sheds light on both. I mean, they were a, a, a very unique regiment. They had this uniform that was one of a kind, red pants, kind of a zouave, chasseur uniform, but um, brass buttons up and down the front of the jacket. And they were in all the major battles. They were in, you know, first bull run, second bull run, Antietam, Gettysburg, all three days. Uh, but they were also sort of, you know, they were good at baseball. They were, they were these city kids, um, good at baseball. They put on, uh, theatrical performances throughout the war. They, they got up to pranks and stunts and, um, and they were part of Brooklyn at the time was a very interesting, 
you know, that you had abolitionists, but you also had people who were economically invested in the economy as it was. And, and so New York and Brooklyn, which were different cities back then, are a fascinating backdrop for it all, too. So I'm, I'm, I'm deep into it. I'm going to be looking for a publisher in the coming weeks, actually. And uh, yeah, that's my, that's my fascination at the moment. Well, I'm going to be looking out for that book, and if anybody wants to buy I-69, you can find it on Amazon still, um, and they can follow you on all of your social media, as I do, and keep up with uh, when these different projects um, uh, come to life. Thank you so much. We need to get you back up here as soon as all this you know, COVID stuff is over with. I would love it. I'd love to see... Uh, I have not been there since it was... a. Uh parking lot in a dream so and we do a lot <laughs> yeah. of uh, civil war uh type things so uh put us on your next uh book tour for your uh civil war book and we have reenactments here so i know this yes yes I'd love to have you <laughs> love to have you here thank you for listening to real foot forward be sure to like subscribe and leave us a review Start planning your visit to discovery park of america by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.